Everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. I hope that everybody's having a great day. Look, I am more than certain that you are about to really truly enjoy the following video that Marion and I did. But in the meantime, I want to remind you of something. We need your support. There's so much ongoing work at the Odyssey Project that needs uh, support. Everything from the Black Man Lead Rite of Passage in Initiative, Restoring Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, Work and Programs for Young Black Girls and Young Women. Uh, also, uh, Black uh, Empowerment Initiative, Music is Life program, and so much more. More importantly, we have just initiated a program where we're going on a 15-city tour where I am literally going to spend a week in each of these cities teaching and implementing the programs that we have created at the Odyssey Project so that we create a national network that is empowering our children. Right now, the cities that are on this list include Memphis, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Charlotte, Chicago, St. Louis, Miami, Los Angeles, New Orleans, and Detroit. We still have a couple of more cities to add to it. We're looking and evaluating uh, strategically as well as need, but we need your support. So go to the description box, look at the ways that you can give, and show your love. On that note, I'm out of here. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in. I'm here with my wife, Marion. This would normally be a um, this on did it freeze? Okay, here we go. That we would actually shoot this on our YouTube channel. However, uh, there were some technical difficulties. We wanted to go ahead and get this out to you guys uh, to share some things with you. First and foremost, we want to share that we have just launched Marion's YouTube channel for Restoring Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which will eventually involve into Restoring Ghetto's Forgotten, where we'll uh, touch the lives of young youth regardless of uh, uh, well, drew a blank. That's rare. But uh, we're, we're going to start out with what she Thank has specialized uh, specialized in, uh, dealing with young girls. Uh, we're going to eventually get into merging what I do with black men lead and black young black males. And we're going to do work to touch and connect and make sure no one's falling through the gap. Uh, look in the uh, description box of the video no matter where you're watching this at this video is going to end up on YouTube it's going to end up on Vimeo it's going to be here on Facebook it's going to be on a number of other pages uh, probably end up on her page as well go click the link that uh, in the description box go to her channel subscribe to her channel especially for those of you who are looking for encouragement those of you who are looking for inspiration those of you who are looking for advice and understanding and help in dealing with a lot of the things that you have gone through that you may even believe people no one else can understand what you're going through if you've ever read Marion's book, Restoring Ghettos, I mean, not Restoring, Ghettos Forgotten Daughters. If you've ever read that book, you know she has uh, come through a lot. She is a survivor. She is a winner. She is a fighter. Those are the attributes that warm my heart with her. Yes, she's a very attractive person on the outside, but it was what was on the inside that won me over. It was her willingness to do the work to become something she desired to be without being held back by something she's been through and that is what makes her special and she talks about it she teaches she shares with young women all the time she works with young girls she's worked with young girls who are uh underage but incarcerated she's done a lot of work she shared of herself she's told her story unabashedly when i tell you she opens up and tells you the raw truth in this book and she has no problem sharing it with people in open forums and as a public speaker she's done great i'm gonna just let her say a little thing first of all you have to understand this this uh youtube channel is huge 
it's huge because we are complete opposites in a lot of ways. And people say, well, how does that work out? To me, personally, your marriage is great when you have a partner who's an opposite because they become your balance. When you are a person that takes risks, you need a person that's not risky. Or both of y'all will be jumping off cliffs. <laughs> so she's the thinker and the baby, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we need to take, and I'm the let's go for it guy. And we, I pull her out of her comfort zone and she keeps me from flying off the cliff. Right. We, we bring that balance to one another. It's not about both of us thinking alike. Because what happens is when, it, when you and your partner have the same weaknesses, there's no, there's no strengths in that area. I found a partner who covers my weaknesses because she's strong in those areas. And I think I do the same thing for her. I think right. that I uplift her in ways that she hasn't had that 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 safety net. She can take chances now because she's not taking them alone. Right. And so we we work that out. So she's my counterbalance. So for her getting on a video, she does it. But I guarantee you, for every time you've seen a video that Marion Marion has done, it was about it. Hundred and thirteen takes. No, not necessarily. I'm, I'm exaggerating. I mean, there's some videos that I get on. If I have a message that has to come out of me, then it just flows out of me. I don't have to fight it. I don't hesitate. But if I got to think of something to say, then yeah, it's hard because I'm a very natural and genuine person. So if I'm not passionate about it or if I'm not really feeling it, you're going to be able to tell on camera. So I just try to make sure I'm ready for that video. Right. And so I'm I'm the other person. There's nothing that I, I'm not ready to talk about pretty much. And I'm exaggerating. But I mean, if I'm going to get on and talk about it, I'm ready to talk about it. And she has a lot to talk about. And I know this because she talks to me. And so I'm going, OK, we need to get that on video. And then it's like, OK, I got to drag her in here to get her on the video. And it's just th that's how she is when she's got something she really want to say. Like she says, you're here it. But there's so much that it may not be passionate at the moment that God has placed in her through her life experiences that I get to hear daily. And I'm going, that's heat. That's heat right here. Or she'll go on and she'll type it. And then we'll have the conversation about it. And I'm going, yeah, what you just typed and shared, that's all right. That, that's like, that's hitting home. But they ain't hearing what I'm hearing right now. We, <laughs> we need to get out there and do that. And, and so for her to sit up and not just say, okay, Rick, you know, I'm going to jump on with you and do some videos with you at least twice a week, which we've agreed to do. But she comes to me today and say, I'm doing my own channel. I'm like, okay. And I'm excited because I know people are going to win because they are going to <laughs> Isaiah talking about Ricky and his cliff line. Mind your business. Mind your business, player. Mind your business. But anyway, that's what I want you to do. So I want you to get on that. Marion, <clears throat> if you don't mind, just tell them a little bit about what inspired you to write Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, to give them a little bit of your background. Anybody that's been on my channel knows, know. they know, but for the people who are going to watch this on Facebook or some of the new people who are coming to my channel who had, haven't heard your story, tell them a little bit about yourself, where you come from. Uh, however long or short, I mean, however long or short it takes is whatever. We here, we got much time as you want, as little time as you want to take. Well, okay. Um, what inspired me to write the book was really my personal relationship with God himself. He, and when I say this, some people think I'm crazy, but he came to me twice in a dream and he told me to tell my story. The first time I was like, no, there's no way I'm not telling my story. There's too much guilt there's too much shame there's too much of my story that i don't want other people to know and so i wouldn't the first time i was like no i'm not doing that you're gonna we're gonna have to find another way but the second time it was after i had i had just purchased my house and i purchased it alone i was a single mom and i had came i had came through a lot and so god was actually blessing me tremendously and so at that particular time, he came to me again and he wanted me to tell my story and I didn't know how I was going to do it, but it was so pronounced. It was so profound and I can't communicate how he communicates with me very clearly, but he can come to me very clearly and give me a, um, something that I have to do. And I know it's him and I know that I have to do it. And so he came to me that second time and I said, OK, I'll tell my story. And that's how it came about. So I just started writing. And I put it on paper and 
and I just got it out of me. And then so after I wrote the book, I got connected with a group called Youth Solutions. And this uh, ministry is a part of Harris County uh, Juvenile Probation. It's actually in the jail. So I was able to work with them for about almost five years. And I would go out and I would do public speaking and I would do mentoring. And just recently, I've decided to kind of branch off from them a little bit and do what God is calling me to do further. And that's to get more involved with the stuff that he's called me to do individually, not by myself, maybe bringing other people to assist, but it's time for me to go ahead and step out on faith and do what he's calling me to do. So that's pretty much it. Oh, and um, that what that's that promoted me to write my story. But then also there's the whole basis of my title is called Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters. And so there's young women and boys that grew that grows up in the ghetto. We can't determine who our parents are. We can't determine how much money they make. We can't determine if we're in poverty. We can't determine if they're drug users. We can't determine if they're child mother. You know, none of that we have we don't have any part of that. And I just feel that most kids that grow up in the ghetto, we're forgotten about. We're marginalized, we're tossed aside, ostracized, whatever you want to call it. Nobody cares about little poor black kids. Nobody. So that's why I named it Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, because I care because I was one of those people. I was one of those thro throwaways. I was one of those people that dropped out of school. I was one of those people that felt forgotten about and invisible and didn't feel any love whatsoever, didn't know how to love. And then so when God came into my life and he restored me, he, he gave me a task. He gave me work to do. So I'm working. I'm in my work. And I'm constantly talking to young girls, trying to help them move beyond where they are and letting them know how beautiful, how special they are and how they can go beyond where they are at the very moment. So I'm very passionate about helping our youth. And that's what the title is all about. Um, I'm sorry, I just got emotional. But it's about restoring our youth, ghetto's forgotten daughters. I want all of us to be refused to be forgotten. So when I go out and I talk to youth, I say, you refuse to be forgotten. Refuse it. You're not a statistic. You're going to do something with your life, and I'm going to show you how. And I'm going to show you how God restored me and how he did it for me. And if he could do it for me, he could do it for anyone. So that's what helped me write this story and tell my story. And that doesn't even touch or scratch the surface. If I were white right now, I'd be blushing. Uh, I would be blushing because listening to her speak and understanding her story. And just a little, just a little bit of background, because I want you to really go to that channel and let her feed you. If you are a young woman, uh, 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 a young girl or a young woman, or maybe even a middle-aged woman who has gone through a very traumatic childhood and you have did everything you could to kind of mask it and try to uh, create this illusion in order to escape it you need to really pay attention to what she talks about because she talks about work but she is not talking about just going she's talking about the work on self first right she's talking about the fact that when you sit up and say okay god heal me there's a part that god does and there's a part that you have to do Right. And how I met my wife is she was working on her right. and she found me because that was just an element that she felt I could help with. And so our first relationship was professional. And then she this is before she finished the book. Right. She was writing the book, but she hadn't finished it when I came along. And I encouraged her to finish that book, get it published. We worked together for some months, almost close to a year. And then she went away and I'm going to tell, I'll tell you and I tell everybody that she knows the moment I met, I mean, the first time I met her, she, she, she introduced herself and I said, that's my wife. And at the time I didn't know she was going to talk to me about, you know, working with me. And I'm the kind of person, I do not mix business with pleasure. She'll tell you, I do not, I'm never, that's just been something I was taught. I don't mix business with pleasure. I don't mix my money with my fun. I just don't. And so when she came to me and I said, that's my wife. And then she said she wanted to work with me. I go, how'd that happen? 
But anyway, I did. I said, okay, if I've got something I can do to help her, I've got to do it. So I did what I thought I could. And uh, she had did so much of the work already. She was already in a zone when I got there because I saw the strength. I just, you know, did a little nudging and just told her basically what I already saw in her. It wasn't anything I added. If, if anything, what I did is I pulled the veneer back for her to see herself because she was already awesome. And so what happened is she went away for a while. I had some things in my life I needed to get straightened out and deal with. And she came back around. And when she came back around, I asked her, say, do you want to be my baby? We never dated before we became a couple. Our first date was after we were literally committed to each other as a couple. It wasn't any dating. It was me observing the God in her, her seeing the God force in me, and her, her seeing the passion in me. And we deciding that we are completely different in a lot of different ways. And it was her telling me, because I'm going, we really got some differences. Yes. And, 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 but it was her saying, if God is in it and we're committed to it, we can make it work. It's not about how easy it is. It's about how committed we are to making it work. So she told me and I said, OK, if you believe we can make it work, then we're going to do it. And I mean, less than a year, we're married. You know, no dating, simply sitting up. I can see the God in you. And what, what, what a lot of people miss when we start talking about marriage is covenant. Mm -hmm. And anybody that understands God, understand God operates in covenant. God doesn't do anything in a relationship that doesn't involve covenant. Everything is about a covenant. Matter of fact, some of the most devastating things that happen biblically, if you look at the biblical history, some of the most dev devastating th things that happen happened when people broke covenants. If you look at the book of Malachi, everybody loves to look at Malachi, but they look at it out of context. If you look at the book of Malachi and you go to the second chapter, you find out that God isn't talking to Israel in, in totality. God is specifically talking to the priests. And he's talking specifically to them about why their relationship is strained, why they can bring their sacrifices to the altar and not get an answer. And he tells them what? because I have seen your treachery with your wife. I have seen how you have been with your wife, your wife by covenant, your wife from youth. You want to get on God's bad side, break covenant. And when you understand covenant, you understand that marriage isn't about how you feel. Marriage is about honoring God by honoring the covenant. It's about being committed to things that sometimes you may not be willing to be committed to at a moment. If you actually think you're going to marry somebody and be with them for 40 years and every day you wake up just loving and wanting to be with that person, that's where a lot of your problem come in. You got an expectation that just simply is not real. Yeah. There are some times you're going to be looking at that person and going, I wish we were next to a cliff. I really do. Yes, Lord. And, 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 and then you sit up and you think about it and you think, wait, God bless me with this. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and attains favor. She's literally the source of my favor. But going back to the, the YouTube channel of Restoring Get Us Forgotten Daughters, it's going to be me going on there, encouraging our youth, going on there, encouraging women, adult women even, because we need encouragement, especially single mothers. And so that's why I'm going to start developing my own channel and speaking and, and engaging people and encouraging people and giving some of my life my life lessons. Um, I was always told even at, as a small girl that I was wise before my age. And so I just feel like I have so much inside that I keep in like sometimes I can even speak to one of my I spoke to my one of my grown daughters and she was looking at me like she didn't know me like she couldn't believe I had all this inside of me. And I'm like, I'm, I've always been that person, but you just have to want to receive it. If you want to receive it, then it'll come out and I'll give that message to you. But I just have so much I want to share with our youth. And that's why I'm stepping out on faith and I'm going to go ahead and do this channel and do a lot of other major things uh, in our communities. So that's basically why I've decided to do this channel. Okay, it's just one other thing I want her to touch on and then we're going to get off of here. Uh, and that is, that's so much going on right now. And I don't want to necessarily, she wants to, that's fine, but I don't necessarily want to get into the specifics about the whole George Floyd thing, because there's so much going on there that could be another hour. What I want to talk about is something she's been mentioning that we are both on the same page on, and we have been 
for years. I think that's the one thing that we've all, one of the things we've always agreed on, and that's community right. and the importance of community, but the failure of blacks to understand it. And I know that she was upset and she posted something not too long ago. We were actually coming back for something we needed to do. We were in the car together and she posted and it was basically the fact that people are up, black people are upset that other black people are getting uh, benefits while they still have to work and some other things. And then there's people posting about why this person gets this. And basically it all boils down to, we haven't learned how to celebrate when someone else wins. We compete with one another. We still have an individualized mindset. Mm -hmm. can, you, can, can you share where you were coming from with that and why you're so passionate about it? I'm passionate about it because until African-American people learn how to build our communities, we're going to always be behind in the race. This is a race. We're going to always be behind because other races, and I'm not against any other race, but other races have figured out community. They figured it out. They know that if they work together, they build together, they grow further. We can't do that for some reason. I'm not talking about, well, I'm talking about us as a collective. More than likely, we cannot do that as a community because we're always concerned about we don't want the next person to gain more than we have. But we need to think about where does that come from? Where does, it, where does that individualized mindset come from? And if we study our history, we'll realize where we got that erroneous thinking. And it's that erroneous thinking that's keeping us from coming together as a unit to build our community so our kids can have something to have for the future what i want to say so they can have a legacy right and in order to have a legacy we got to know how to work together that means if i see a sister say for instance i'm a single mom and i got a home and there's two other single sisters out there that are single moms if i can bring those women into my home and we build together and we start saving and we pay our bills and we build our credit and we do all these things and we save our money then one sister can go get a house we can we can collectively build and help that sister get a house then it's, it's time for the next one then it's time for the next one and then when they move on we bring two more in i'm talking about community building so we don't have to suffer and struggle alone we got to realize there's more people out there struggling than there is making it yeah there's a lot of successful black people out there that has a lot of wealth but they're not going to reach back and help the poor man they're not going to reach back and help their sister that's that's struggling or that brother that's struggling. Mm -mm. So we got to learn how to do that as a community to come together more to be, but first of all, we got to be healthy enough to do it because we can't bring people in our home. That's going to disrupt the balance of our home. So we got to be healthy enough to come together as a group to help each other build. So that's why community is so important to me. And when I see people talking about individualized talking, I can't stand to see that because they don't realize just because you're winning, you by yourself is not going to collectively bring our race up. I don't care how much money you got. If you're not putting back in a pot somewhere, you ain't helping our community. So that's why I'm passionate about it because we have to learn that. And there are a lot of people that starting to do homesteads. Mm -hmm. They're starting to farm and do all those great things, but there's not enough. So that's what I mean about getting away from that individualized thinking. Now do you see why I love this woman? And now do you see why I can get on every day and do what I do? Because this is what's standing beside me, not behind me. This is who is standing beside me. And I, I, I mirror and I back everything she's saying. That's one of the hu huge problems that we face is the individualized thinking and competitiveness that was instilled in us as slaves okay. because we had to fight for whatever bits and pieces and scraps and we were taught to backstab one another right. in order to gain grace with our overseer our master and our mistress mm -hmm. and so we were taught literally to hate one another and when you learn to hate the person who looks like you deep down inside eventually you d develop a disdain for yourself right. and so you start to self-sabotage you start to dis destruct self-destruct and so what she's pointing at is that that needs to first of all be a healing and we talk about that in a lot of the work, in a lot of my books, we talked about the, the need for healing. We talk about the fact that you can't go through 246 years of chattel slavery, not have any type of treatment for all the trauma from the generations from 1619 to 1865, and then unleash 12 years of uh, reconstruction, 
another 15 to 20 years of black codes and convict leasing, mm -hmm. another 70 years of Jim Crow, and then we're now in mass incarceration and gentrification. Right. You, in the, between all that, you had redlining, mm -hmm. benign neglect, urban renewal, and you expect after the initial trauma of going through years and years of passing down trauma as slaves, then to go through all the other re-injury, which is trauma stacked on top of trauma, it's called complex trauma. Right. It makes PTSD look calm. Right. And yet we are still strong enough to stand and resist and be resilient and we're still breathing and they can't figure it out. They can't, they can't figure out what with everything we've done to them, they still here. And now they they seem to be getting stronger. Here's the thing. When we begin the healing process that she's talked about, and we start thinking from a community perspective, that's the place they have us right now, right. is the lack of unity. Right. We got 50 million people working for 50 million different ways for, for what's supposed to be a common cause, and nobody wants to come together because everybody's more concerned about whether their name is going to be on it right. than they are about winning ego and so we got to get out get that out of the way I, I, i'll tell you this and i'm done i said this a long time ago i don't care if my name is on any of the things that i've worked 30 years to research and build don't care because if i touch lives my legacy lives right. I, I tell people all the time and i've said this and i'm going to leave this with you the way that we're going to win is it's going to take black men and women who are willing to plant seeds and babies that they may not even live long enough to see come to fruition. Did you hear me? Right. You got to be willing to plant a seed that you're not going to get a pat on the back for because it may not it may not bear fruit in your lifetime. Right. That's what it's about. It's about seeing beyond now. See, we got a bunch of people who want to hear you did a great job. Oh my God, man, this dude over there at so-and-so doing this and this. And so you want to see your name in light so much that you're going for the quick fix, the band-aid. And, and, and we, you don't undo 400 years of trauma in a year. Mm -mm. You got to catch a, a generation of kids that haven't been touched by it yeah. and protect them with your life and pour into them who they are whose they are who designed them who built them why they're special why they can do anything then you guard them until it sets yeah. so when you unleash them on the world what the world does to them doesn't break them that's what we're talking about doing we're talking about creating a legacy that outlives us a legacy that speaks on our behalf after we're gone that's what the Bible says, that a wise man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. It wasn't just speaking about money. Right. What did, what did granddaddy do when granddaddy was here? What did great-great-granddaddy do? What did he do? Did, did, did he leave a bunch of traumatized adults? Mm. And then they grew up to traumatize their children, and then they grew up to traumatize their children? Or did, or did he leave behind a strong, healthy man and woman that was able to cover, protect, and provide? And then their children go over and do the same thing. That's what we want. We want to get away from all the toxic behavior and the traumatized kids and situations. We want healthy adults. And it starts at home and it starts with our youth. That's why I'm so compassionate about our youth because they are our future. If they don't make it, there's no future for the world. So that's why this, the, what, what we do for people is so important because it's not just about us. When we're long and gone, we want people to be able to say, well, one day this person poured into my life and because of that, I am thankful and I'm still here and now I'm healthy and I'm whole and I can teach that to my children. So that's what this work is all about. And on that note, we're going to go ahead and get off of here because uh, I'm getting fired. Like I said, it's, it's just amazing and I'm, I'm so grateful. Uh, to God, I tell everybody that I start my day with gratitude. That's how I start every day. I don't wake up and face any problem until I've shown gratitude to the creator for what I'm blessed with and for what I'm going to be blessed with. And every day, my greatest thank you to God is for her. I wake up in the morning. She still sleep. I roll over and I look at her and she takes that breath that lets me know she's still with me. And I say, thank you. And so I'm in this place. I'm in this place where I can take on the world. And she have looked at me. She, sometimes she's like, 
you know, looking at me like, and she tells me that the calm that I have really settles sometimes when there's a lot going on. And you know, when you're trying to do right, there are spiritual attacks coming from every freaking direction. But I love her strength. And so um, I'm going to ask you guys, go over, look at that link in there to her new, new YouTube channel. Click that link and subscribe to that channel. Uh, you There's gonna... nothing on there yet, but it will be. <laughs> yeah, it's, she, she'll have something up. Trust me, she's got plenty <laughs> to talk about. Uh, but get on over there. Uh, subscribe. Uh, I've got a bunch of her stuff that I'm going to send her that she can upload that I've already got on my channel. <laughs> so, you know, I, every time she does a video, I steal it and put it on my channel because it's heat and it, it blesses people. And that's what it's about. It's about blessing people. So we uh, at the Wallace household want to thank all of you for the love and support that you've shown thank us you over all. the years uh, with everything we've gone through. I see some of the people who have really been uh, supportive. Uh, Lisa, you've prayed for me the long before she came along. Uh, and you know, we've been through a lot. We give each other all kind of fits and trouble and I, I Isaiah, I'll deal with you later. Uh, but, um, something Isaiah said that I want, I saw him say it, but it was while Marion was talking and I want to read it real quick. He said, I've learned that when one person tells their story, they end up speaking for thousands of silent voices Yeah, that shook me. That's why you don't be quiet on God. Yeah. When God says speak, speak because it's not about you. It's not. Somebody needs to hear that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to hear that someone went through what they went through or maybe even worse and came out. And not only came out, came out with their hands up in victory. And so that's what this is about. So once again, we ask you to go over there and subscribe. We thank you. And we are going to be bringing some heat to you in the coming weeks. Uh, thank you, baby, for coming on. You're welcome. You know. Um, <laughs> thank you for having me. All right. Okay. And on that note, we're going to get off of here. You guys have an awesome day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here. Dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time you know outside of the businesses that i run like myriad business solutions the visionetics institute odyssey media group i also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in houston dallas and other areas uh, i'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the odyssey project is doing in the inner cities uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.